So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for um, GAR Hall Special Events Zoom Edition. Hmm. And we've been having a lot of fun with this over about the last, about a month we've been doing it now. We've had some great programs we're excited about tonight. Let me just tell you a few things before we start. As you can see in the chat area, um, we do ask that you keep your mics muted. If you do have any questions that you want to ask, please put them in the chat and then I will ask them to Dell at the end. Um, we are offering these programs free of charge. They're available to the public. If you have friends who want to come, please, you know, invite them into them. We do gratefully accept any donations though that you may want to send in. We have a PayPal address and you can mail in a check to the society. You can also become a member. You can go on our webpage, um, situatehistoricalsociety.org and find out all that information. And also, if you want to send me your information via chat and get on the mailing list, and then you get all the information on all of the upcoming programs. Just real quickly, I'll let you know what's coming up. In a few weeks, we've got Lyle Nyberg, who is going to be talking about his new book, um, Summer Suffragettes of Situate, uh, which just came out a few weeks ago. And um, so that'll be the beginning of October. And then we have got um, Jim Glinsky, who is going to be talking about the history of Situate's water, which should be quite an interesting subject um, with what's been going on as of late with, with the water in town. And then we have got, um, so that's October. November, we head into uh, Christopher Daly will be back with us. He was just here a few weeks ago. He'll be talking about 1620 and it's called the first year, which is the first year of the pilgrims arriving. Then we have a um, good friend of the society, Jeremy uh, D'Entremont, who will be coming in and giving a talk on haunted lighthouses. <gasps> I know Jeremy. I'm excited to hear about that. I'll have yes, to join. Yes. And this is actually going to be his last live with, um, presentation because he's moved on to other things, but he was supposed to be here over a year ago and um, because of a snowstorm and this and that, he couldn't come. So this will be his last presentation. So we're, we're excited, but we're sad about that. Um, and then we have got um, Sal St. George will be coming in. He will be doing a presentation on the history of the making of the famous movie, everybody's favorite, um, It's a Wonderful Life. And that'll be in December. And then in January, we have got Herb Crean's coming back again to do another talk with us on some other Red Sox stuff because we had so much fun the last time he was here. But now we have got Dell Case. So Dell is a professor at Wheaton College. His resume is about a mile long. So I'd ask that you look it up afterwards because I don't want to take up too much time. But he is an educator, a composer, a conductor. He does it all. And we're very excited to have him here with us. So I'm not going to hold you up anymore. And Dell, welcome. Thank you so much, Gene, for having me here. I'm sorry I can't join you all in person. I think we all agree that it'd be nice to do these in person, and maybe we can do it in person at some point. But I'm thank you, thankful very much for, you, uh, for, for all of you having uh, joined us tonight. Um, I teach down at Wheaton College, and um, I conduct the orchestra down there, and I teach classes in classical music. But the music that I have always loved, and don't tell anybody this, the most, is popular music, okay? It's not the classical stuff. Now, my colleagues are okay with that. I do teach classes in popular music at Wheaton, but um, I, you know, I I love you know music, rock and roll, and soul, and 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 gospel, and and country, and hip hop, and all these kinds of things. And um, for a long time, when I was studying to be a classical musician, I definitely got the message that that stuff wasn't valuable, which. I can now tell you as a professional is wrong because uh, I've spent much of my career as a teacher teaching students about how to listen to, to pop music 
and how to recognize the richness and the vitality and the power of it. Now, look, everybody, I mean, a lot of people are moved and touched by, by particular songs, whether it's by the Beatles or by anybody. Um, and that's perfectly fine. But um, a lot of times people feel a little bit, I don't know, maybe embarrassed, maybe a little bit shy about admitting that they like a song or that, oh, I love this song, or I, when I hear this song, it makes me think of this. And, you know, I've heard students for 20 years say this kind of thing. And I say, don't be ashamed, don't be afraid, because guess what? Pop music, depending on the song, is just as valuable and important and powerful as, as the music of Mozart. It's just a different kind of language. And it's just sort of too bad that I feel like, generally speaking, people think of classical music as the best the most complicated, the most interesting, the most important. That's not true. And I can say this as someone who's written a symphony, right? I've written, I'm not, how many people do you've ever met that, have you ever met that's actually written a symphony? I have. And I can tell you that I get a lot out of popular music as long as it's good. You know, there's no such thing as, as good music and bad music. There's just good songs and bad songs, right? <laughs> and, you know, the Beatles are, are really, as far as I'm concerned, the best. Now, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about the Beatles, but I might talk about the Beatles in a way that might be a little bit different. It's kind of unique. You know, there are a lot of books about the Beatles. There are a lot of documentaries and films about the Beatles. And 99% of them are about the cultural importance, the haircuts, the way they sang, the way they sounded, what the songs were about right? The drugs, <laughs> the spirituality. These are all really important aspects of the Beatles as a cultural phenomenon. But you know what? People oftentimes forget, or I should say some people forget that they're actually fundamentally musicians. And the reason why the Beatles are, were not just incredibly po popular and important, but the reason why they are still popular among kids, like my kids, you know, it's because the music's so great. And luckily, I've had the extraordinary privilege of you know, training as a, as a classical musician, which has led me to learn how to listen in a very sort of deep way. And I've used those skills not just to you know, teach my students why Beethoven is good, but, why other, but also why other kinds of music are, are good. So that's what I'm gonna be doing tonight. I'm actually gonna put aside a lot of the history and the cultural importance of the Beatles, because you guys can all, honestly, you guys can watch, can learn about that on your own. But it's very rare for, to be honest, it's very rare for somebody to look at the Beatles' music and actually describe and explain sort of why it's so good. Um, and so that's what I'm going to try to do. And my goal for tonight is to help take, help you experience songs that you've known for maybe 50 years and have loved for 50 years and actually hear them in a new way. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm going to make you like them more. Probably you can't, can't do that because you probably love them. That's why you're here. But I guess what I'm trying to do is, is show that there is a, another way to hear them that is even that is an additional way to hear them and, and experience them that adds to the richness and adds to the amount of enjoyment you get from listening to the Beatles. Now, you might want to ask, why am I into the Beatles? I was born in 1974. They had already broken up. But I, the only records that I own, the only LPs, the only vinyl I own are those from my dad. And I remember when I was four or five years old, playing those Beatles records on my little Fisher Price record player. Do you, anybody remember that thing? It's, it was like beige and orange and it was portable. I see someone, I see someone. <laughs> so I used to have that and I would, I would play my dad's Beatles records and I would build Legos. And... I would do that for hours, and I think that maybe that's why I'm really interested in, in picking apart the music of the Beatles and seeing how it's put together. Because while I was learning, I mean, that's the first music I remember loving was the Beatles. And while I was listening to it, I used to build Legos. I used to create, I used to take little blocks and make things. And I almost feel like there's a connection in my brain between sort of constructing things and deconstructing things and listening. So, but having said all of that, I'm going to look at three or four songs and sort of describe some of the reasons why they're so great. Why these, er, these, these Liverpool lads who are in their early 20s were able to create this music that has stood the test of time. 
and to be honest, will stand the test of time, just like Beethoven and Mozart. So in order to do that, I'm actually going to help talk about music in a very analytical way. But you don't have to be a musician to, to understand this. I'm going to describe it. I'm doing a lot of drawing on my computer, on my screen, you'll see. So you don't have to be a musician, but I hope they'll help you understand, give you a way to listen to the Beatles in ways you haven't happened before. So at the end of looking at a couple of songs, I'm going to actually open up the uh, presentation and see if there are any particular songs you'd like me to look at briefly. Maybe there's a song you've always loved that you want to know why it's great. Well, I can describe sort of in some way why it's great. Now, not, not the only way, but from a musician's perspective, I can describe sort of why the music works, if that makes sense. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, you know, you know uh, really one of the greats. I mean, how can you choose? I'm going to start with I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. So if you're watching this, what's going to happen is that suddenly my screen, your screen is going to be taken over by my screen. And you're going to see the lyrics to this song, like a little sheet that I made, but also uh, you'll see a little whiteboard. So here, here goes nothing, okay? Um, this should work. So do me a favor. You can always push escape and, and literally escape from this screen. But if you do, you'll it'd be sort of like closing your eyes while I'm drawing on the drawing board. So please uh, just, it, I mean, you do whatever you need to do. But if you just leave your computer screen alone, it'll sort of be like if you're sitting in a classroom of mine. Now, I'm going to play this song for you. And it's only, it's less than two minutes long. Man, if I could write a, minute, a, a two minute song that would last 50 years, I'd be very happy. Um, so I'm just going to, I mean, I, you know, I know you probably all know this song. I mean, I'm not sure the last time you heard it all the way through, but I'd like you to listen to it. And you know what? I'd like you to listen to it like you're at a classical concert. Don't dance, even though you might want to dance. You know, just try to listen to it. You know, just sort of focus on it. Because remember, as fun as this song was live or to hear, you know, in high school or college or on the radio, this was, was a result of hours and hours and hours of really careful work in a recording studio. So in a sense, we can look at this as a piece of music that was really constructed very carefully, just like Beethoven would have constructed one of his pieces. All right, so I'm going to play this song. Again, it's less than two minutes long. Just as a reminder, and you know what? These days, the world seems like it's a little bit dark. Let's have a little bit of joy by listening to this great song. <laughs> Now that song will, will outlast all of us. I'm going to put me on the screen so we can see at least a few of us. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Um, well, maybe not. Maybe that's a little weird. All right, anyway. Uh, so, you know, I have, I have talked. I have once given a lecture for two hours in this song. So, so I'm going to try not to last two hours. But there's enough here. So the first thing I want to do, folks, as we, as we zero in on the music, is, is look at what we call in, in music theory the form. And the form of a piece of music is just the number of sections. Now, some of you might have heard words like verse and chorus and bridge in a song. And a lot of pop songs have that. Um, this song doesn't really have that. This song is in what, is in what we call an AABA form. And all that means is that there's a section that is then repeated again. Then there's a different section, and then there's a return to the original section. Now, after that, there's can, a bunch of things can happen, but there's no more new music, okay? So I'm actually going to sort of put this stuff, put this away and say, let's just ignore this for now. Now, this form, A, A, B, A, just to walk you through, this is, oh, yeah, I'll have to tell you something. I think you'll understand, blah, 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 blah. I want to hold your hand. It's got a little, that little bit there is called a refrain. I'm going to put R there. And then it repeats, Right? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something, right? It goes on, and there's the refrain, I want to hold your hand. Then there's a separate section. But when I happy, da-da-da-da-da-da, uh, happy inside, right? It's such a feeling that my love, I can't hide. That's different music, so we're going to call that B. Then they return to the original, oh, yeah, it's blah 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 and then the refrain, I want to hold your hand. Now, this form is interesting because, you know, everyone knows the Beatles are rock and roll. Rock and roll was new. It was different. You know, it was the music of the young people, and it was fresh, and, and you know what, it was, it, was, it was uncivilized, and it was wild, and you know, it wasn't based upon, you know, it wasn't the music of the old people, right? It wasn't the music of your parents, you know? It wasn't that light music you're on the radio, or Broadway, or anything like that. You know, it wasn't like Surrey with a fringe on top, or, or anything like that. You know, it wasn't that old fogey stuff, but guess what? This song 
is in a form that is the standard form of Broadway. In fact, it's the standard form for a song of American pop music for at least the previous 40 or 50 years. I don't care if it's Irving Berlin or George, George Gershwin or Harold Arlen, right? This form, A-A-B-A, -A -A, is a standard, in fact, it's called a Broadway song form. So remember, the Beatles were growing up, they were growing up in the 50s and the 60s the, in Britain. They were surrounded by the BBC radio playing all the American Broadway hits, hits all, the, all the pop music. They knew this stuff. And this is the form. So as radical as you think the Beatles are, they are fitting, they fit most of their early music into this form. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to do the world's worst version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow to show you. Ready? Here's Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, da 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 da. That's the A. And then, somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, da 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 da. Where happy little bluebirds fly, da 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 da. That's the B. And then what happens after that? That's where you'll find me. Somewhere over the rainbow. So the, the famous song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the greatest, probably many people, the greatest song of the 20th century, that's in, this, that's, that's in this form. So the Beatles are taking this really exciting, fun, danceable music with a little bit of blues, a little bit of excitement. But you know what? They're still writing the kind of music that, that fits into the music that their parents loved. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Beatles have such cross-generational um, uh, um, uh, appeal even now because they're, they're, they were not just revolutionary. They, they knew their stuff. They had studied. Now, maybe not in school, but they were surrounded by the music of, of, of Britain and of, and of Mer American pop music and country and gospel and rock and roll. And, and they made this amalgamation of music. So, by the way, other songs that are in this form are A Hard Day's Night. That's also in this AABA form. So many early, early and mid Beatles songs are in this form. So that's one interesting thing. Now, I'm going to get rid of all this business. And now I'm going to show you something really cool about this song. So let's look at, I know this might be a little bit small for you folks, and I, 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 I can't figure out a better way for, to do this. I wish I could join. I wish you could join me in my classroom where I could come to you in situ. Um, I'd even bring my own whiteboard. Um, this is the lyrics to the A section. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something I think you'll understand. When I say something, that's something. I want to hold your hand. Now, what I want to do is I want to, I want to draw what we call the melodic contour of this melody. Melodic refers to the melody. That's the thing that we sing. The contour is the shape. And when we describe melodic contour, we basically take our little, you know, our little chalk, and we, when the music goes down, we go down. And when it goes up, we go up. It's pretty simple. Um, it's just a way of visualizing how the music might look on the, on the page if it were written down on staff paper, but you don't need to read music, and the Beatles didn't read music, okay? So as an example, if, we did, if I did the contour for Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and I know, I know you want me to sing that again, because I do a really good Judy Garland, okay? But here it is. I would go, somewhere, and I would do this, somewhere. Do you see what I mean? I just sort of go up when the voice goes up. And if I continue, I'm going to try to, sing and use my computer at the same time, which is something's probably going to explode here. So let's be very careful. So somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I went to once in a lullaby. Sorry, that was a mistake right there. That last little bit. <laughs> and if I sing again, somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. I can't remember the words. Da 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 da. So can you kind of see how when I draw it, it sort of sort of shows a shape of the melody? Now, if I wrote this down on musical notation, you would see little musical notes going in the same shape. But you don't have to read music to to appreciate this song. Now, why I love this the song "Somewhere Over the Rainbow," by the way, is that look at this. Look at the shape of this melody. Look at the overall shape. What's that shape? The answer, of course, is a rainbow. The shape of the melody is a rainbow. Now, not many people notice that, but it's kind of amazing. Now, I don't know if Harold Arlen knew that, was thinking of it, but it's kind of amazing. 
So this is what it, drawing the melody of a music, the melodic contour can do for you. So that's a, now I think you'll probably never hear that song again without thinking of the, how the music actually demonstrates a rainbow. Kind of cool. So let's go back and talk about the Beatles. What if we do that for I Want to Hold Your Hand? I want to show you something really cool. So here, I'm going to draw it. Okay, and again, I'm going to sing it for you. Maybe I'll play it for you. Actually, you know this? I'm going to go back and I'm going to play it, and I'm going to draw while we listen, okay, so you can follow. I wanna now I'm going to stop it right there. So do you, know, do you recognize that sort of, we sort of draw how it sounds? Oh, yeah, I'll, sorry, tell you something. I think you'll understand. And there's that really low note, right? When I say that's something. Now, if you look at this, I could probably show this to, you know, a, maybe a five or a six year old and say, what pattern do you see? Obviously, you see a pattern going down, right? And here's what I think of when I hear this song. This song is about a teenage boy being really nervous about asking a girl out. Now, let me tell you a true story. And this is totally true. I asked my wife out by asking first to hold her hand. And it's not just because I'm a Beatles fan. It was seven, six or seven years ago, I unfortunately lost my first wife to cancer 10 years ago. I was raising two little girls on my own. And there was a woman that I worked with and she was wonderful and lovely. And we started to have dinner with a bunch of other colleagues over at Wheaton College. And eventually people kept dropping out and it was just me and her. And then we went for a walk. And we were walking and I said, you know, can I hold your hand? And she said, yes. And the rest is history. Um, and now we have a lovely four-year-old together. Um, so this is a true, this is a totally 100% true story. But I didn't think about the time. But, you know, I thought it's better than just going in for the kiss. It's 2000, you know, it was 2014. You just can't go in for the kiss anymore. Got to ask about holding your hand. So I know what it's like. I literally know what it's like to be really nervous about asking someone to hold your hand. And because, you know, if she, if she says yes, you know what that means? Well, that means you're probably going to get married as far as I'm concerned. But the point is that it means something. And it means something just as importantly for me as, you know, a 38-year-old at the time versus like a 15-year-old. You know, and this is a song about... I love how this, this kid is walking, he's walking, you know, down the street with this girl and he's saying, and you can sense he wants to ask her, but you notice how he's beating around the bush. He's saying, oh yeah, I got something to tell you. Um, I think you'll understand it. Um, you know, it's something I really want to tell you, but uh, I'm not sure. But, you know, he's definitely nervous. He doesn't just say, hey, baby, hold my hand. No, 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 no. He's, he's just waiting. And he finally, I got the sense that he like closes his eyes and says, after all this perseverating, uh, um, I want to hold your hand. And he closes his eyes and sticks his hand out. Now, this is a really important moment because maybe this is the first time that he, you know, this character like really fell in love with someone. But the music makes this drama, drama happen because look, all of these things right here, it's kind of like, he's like, his voice is going, he's like, oh yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand. You know, he, this is not the, this is not a Lothario. This is not Don Juan saying, I'll tell you something I think you'll understand. You know, he's not super excited. He's not super confident here. By the way, I'm sorry if I'm too loud. But, you know, you know, he's not. The music is, oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand when I say that something. Now, folks, what happens when he actually gets the guts to say it? What does the music do? I want to hold your... And, right? Isn't that so fantastic? It really is like he closes his eyes, sticks at his hands, and just like, oh my gosh, here goes nothing. It's like jumping off the high diving board. So let me play that again. I want you to see how the music, the, the melody, sort of, it doesn't just sort of, it supports the, the really powerful internal drama of this, this young boy who's, you know, and I look, it could be a girl, and it doesn't matter, the Beatles are writing songs that resonated with teenagers. We've all been, I hope, I hope all of you have had the chance to hope that someone holds your hand and ask them, and then they said yes. I really hope you have all, you have had that. I've had that twice in my life, you know? So let's listen to it, and just, I want you to see how on that high note, it's just this explosion of, ah, here we go, and then, so let's listen to it. So let's see if you can follow. You see that? Now, what, the other cool thing is that th what this should do is, of course, is it should be, oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand when I'll say that something. I want to hold your hand. I mean, that's how it's supposed to go if you follow the pattern, right? 
And that's also what's so brilliant here because he set, they set you up to expect it. But as with any great piece of music or art, at the last minute, there's a surprise that keeps you listening. So instead of, I want to hold your hand, the lowest note, remember, was on hand. Sorry. Um, I think you'll understand the lowest note of the song was down here on stand. The highest note is hand, right? It's so wonderful. It's like he just goes for it. Now, here's the cool thing. The story of the song never, they never, the, the lyrics never tell you whether she says yes. Think about it. But I, the music tells you. Because what happens after he says it? The music just goes down and down and down. It's like you hold your breath and then, right? So listen to here. And if I draw it, it's just this. It's just a big relaxation. Let's go back and listen to that one more time. And I want you to see how the music supports this little drama. It's a whole opera that takes place place in about 30 seconds, right? He's nervous. He stutters and mutters. He really doesn't know if he's going to have the guts to do it. He finally suddenly says it, closes his eyes, and you know right here, that's when she says, yeah. Because then he just sings to the stars, I want to hold your hand. I want He's basically saying, I am holding your hand. Your hand feels great. Let's go to the sock hop. You know, you can tell that that's what he's saying, right? He doesn't need to say it. It's the way he says it that tells you everything. So let's try to listen to that, okay? And so it's a, it really is like a miniature opera. And this is an example of how if you read the words on, this, on the page like a poem, yeah, you wouldn't know at all what's going on in the mind of this little, this teenage boy. But the music makes it 100% clear. And that's why, I'm sorry to tell you, but music's better than poetry. <laughs> sorry about that. Or music does more than poetry. It's not better. I love poetry. Music does different things. So there is one other thing. And again, I, literally, literally, I have literally talked about the song for two hours. So I'm not going to keep going much longer. But there's one more thing I want to show you that I love about this song. And that is a very interesting, complicated, uh, uh, well, it's not too complicated, an idea called, I'm trying to make this work, called harmonic rhythm. Now, this is a very advanced musical topic, so I'm going to have to charge you for the next part of the lecture. Um, you can send money to me at Wheaton College. Um, but this is pretty advanced. Uh, and harmonic rhythm is not that complicated, but it, is, but it is advanced. And it basically means how long a chord of music lasts. Now, you might ask, why does it matter how long a chord lasts? If you've ever played in a band or if you've ever, you know, played uh, from a lead sheet on piano, you know that it's not just about playing the E chord, the A chord, or the B minor chord. It also matters when you change the chord. And harmonic rhythm is kind of like, it's the way we describe how fast the, the chords change. And what that, the harmonic rhythm is kind of like, I like to think of it as like the transmission uh, of a piece of music. And what, the, what does a transmission do in a car? It, you know, it's, it allows you to go places, but it also, it, it provides the power. So we're going to talk about harmonic rhythm. Here's how it works. This piece of music is in what we call 4-4 four, four time. So we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. It makes not, this is not rocket science, right? And here's how, the harmon how this piece of music works. Every time you count to four, there's a different chord, okay? So, oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. Every, every one of these lines I'm drawing here lasts four beats, okay? I'm sorry, I should try this again. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand when I tell you something. I, I want to hold your hand. So each, even though I didn't draw these to scale, each of these is four beats long. All right? But guess what? And that's fine. It's not uncommon for a chord to last four. It's easy. You just strum, 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 strum. Easy, easy peasy, right? But you know what? There's something really special that happens at this moment where he says, I want to hold your hand. And here's what happens. Instead of the chords changing every four beats, the chords change every two beats. Okay? So I'm going to draw them half as long. Now, you may think to yourself, wow, this is a new level of nerdiness when it comes to pop music. This is just 
you, this is just rock and roll. Stop being such a nerd. Well, let me tell you, that I'm, I'm going to keep going. Why does this matter? Because guess what? Just like in a transi- transmission, when the chords change faster, we feel more energy. We feel more excitement. We feel like we're moving to fifth gear. And of course, that's what you need to happen here. Because the moment where he says, I want to hold your hand, and you realize that she said yes, then he just relaxes and just shifts into fifth gear, and the car just starts driving, and he just dances to the stars, right? So this is a little hard to feel, but when I have students in person do this, I have students walk around the room, and I have them take a step every four beats. So if you're at home, you could even try this. Or if you wanted, you can just sort of tap your foot. So what you'll do is you'll basically, I'll clap here. It might sound a little bigger on my, my, on my microphone, but I'll basically, if you say, oh yeah, I'll two, three, four, something, two, three, four. I think you'll understand. That's the pattern, right? And you'll notice that once we get to this refrain, when the release happens, suddenly the chords go by twice as fast, as fast and the whole song just speeds up. And it's just like this release. And without this change, the song would, would not nearly, it wouldn't sound nearly as much of, as a, of a, like, a triumph, like a triumph. It wouldn't sound like a release. So you can, I'm going to try to, I'm going I'm to count and clap while we do this again. And, and so you can do it at home or you can even step up, walk, you know, stand up and step if you want. But this is just the last thing I'll say about the song. But it's a reason, basically the idea is that once we get to this part right here, suddenly everything in the music tells us, hey, let's relax. Let's have fun. This is easy. Let's go, basically, let's go downhill. All right? Let's listen. So hopefully that didn't sound too loud and horrible in your ears, but I hope you could hear it. Now, you might have never, I'm sure you've never paid attention to this before because even my most advanced students have never really thought about harmonic rhythm. That's why I'm giving you the big, that's why, A, they they, they pay me the big bucks. B, that's why I'm expecting checks in my box at Wheaton. But the point is that this is a really important thing And it really makes the song work. So I've just spent, you know, 30 minutes talking about the brilliance of uh, of the Beatles as songwriters. And I've talked about things like melodic contour and I've talked about harmonic rhythm. These are things I teach my, my college students. And the first question that everyone asks me is, did the Beatles know what they were doing? Right? And the answer is, of course they did. Now, the, what you're really asking when you think about the question is, could the Beatles explain what they were doing? And the answer is no, they could not. <laughs> because when you get to a level of genius, you don't need to be able to explain it. You just know when it's good. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not there. That's why I have to go to school. Um, but remember, the Beatles didn't just wake up and write this stuff. They worked together in high school, and then they went to, to they then they went to Germany. Don't forget, for a year, and they played in North Germany, one show a night for a year, and they worked on these songs, and that's where they developed their craft as songwriters and performers. Have you ever heard the German version of "I Want to Hold Your Hand"? Has anybody heard that? Oh, yeah, come give dear man a hand. If you haven't heard it, I'm just going to play it because it's awesome. Okay. Uh, my wife teaches German, so she, of course, uses these all the time. But, yeah, the Beatles did both uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, a German version for their German fans, as well as um, Sie liebt dich, ja, ja, ja. Sie liebt dich, ja, ja, ja. She loves you, believe it or not. Let me play just the come to give dear man a hand. Ready? And when I right, touch you. you. And I love that it's not Sie lieb dich, ja. It's Sie lieb dich, ja, ja, ja. So they, they you know, because they were a big following. But the point is that they worked and worked and worked to hone their craft. Did they have a PhD in music theory explaining to them why their music worked? No, they didn't need it because they had screaming girls telling them when they hit just the right chord. They returned from Germany and they were the Beatles. They had to replace their drummer first. But, you know, so they did know what they were doing, but they learned it from on the boots on the ground practice with real time feedback. So I want to play you another song from the Beatles early period. And by the way, when a lot of people talk about the Beatles as brilliant songwriters, they oftentimes talk of them later in their career. And when they were, when they, of course, when they, when they are released Sergeant Peppers, etc. cetera, um, when they were psychedelic, you know, progressive, but you know, their brilliance 
comes in the very beginning. So, you know, we don't have a ton of time tonight. I want to actually make sure there's time for people to, to, to phone in the request to WDEL. Um, and I, what I would like to do is I would look at She Loves You because it's also, it's a similar song, but it's almost the opposite of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Okay. So if you don't remember this song, I will play it for you. Let me play it for you. Uh, well, maybe we'll play the English version. Sie liebt dich, ja, ja, ja. <laughs> okay, here we go. Sorry, let me try that again. My computer's being a little bit slow. Okay, here we are. She loves that. Okay, I hope you could all hear that, that song. Uh, I saw some people bopping along, so I know some people could hear it. So uh, I'm going to presume that you could. Um, if you're having some technical difficulties, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so this is another song that definitely would resonate with anybody who's fallen in love. It's sort of the same thing as I want to hold your hand. But the difference here is that the, you know, I'm going to say it's a guy. The guy already had, the, the question he has, the the, the tension here that drives this little miniature opera is that he thought he lost his love. So, so this is his friend saying, you think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday. Right? Now, if someone came up to me and said, I saw your wife the other day, I might be a little bit nervous, right? Especially, well, let, let me know, everything's going fine. But the idea is if you were worried about your girlfriend and your friend came up and said, you think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday. You know, the, what could the next thing be? It could be she was standing in Harvard Square burning a picture of you, you know? Now, you know, you don't know what he's going to say. There's tension there. Now, imagine you've never heard this song before. Think about the person who's being addressed. You think you lost your love? Well, I saw her. And then I'm thinking, oh, nuts, right? Well, it's you she's thinking of. And she told me what to say. Guess what? That still doesn't mean anything. It's you she's thinking of, and she told me what to say, and that thing was, I never want to hear from you again because you are a horrible person. So up to this point in the song, to be honest, we don't really know, right? We don't really know what's going to happen yet. We don't know if this is going to be a, 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 a happy ending or a sad ending. So just like, it's sort of like the, sort of in some ways it's the same as I want to hold your hand, where... There's intention. And think about this. Friend. This friend of yours is a real jerk for saying it this way. Because if I was a friend, I would say, oh, Jim, I'm so happy, to, so happy to see you. I talked to Margaret yesterday. She loves you. She still loves you. Right? But that's not what his friend says. His friend says, you think you lost your love. Well, I saw her yesterday. Yeah, she's thinking of you all right, buddy. And she told me what. I'm like, get it. Just tell me. Just don't bury the lead. Tell me. The point is here that as songwriters, the Beatles know that you don't start a song with the answer. You start the song with the question. You start the song with tension, with excitement, with, the qu with, 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 um, with um, suspense, right? Now, of course, just like with I Want to Hold Your Hand, the answer is, you know what she said? She said she loves you. Ah, right? So just like in I Want to Hold Your Hand, there's a first half of the song that is increasing tension and a second half, that's resolution, all right? So if we go, now that you guys are all smart about music, if I go all the way back here, and what if we do we'll get rid of all this stuff here, and we do the same thing that we did for She Loves You and see how it works. So I'm gonna play it again, and I'm gonna draw the melody. I don't have the lyrics here in a way that's, you'll hear them, okay? This is after the little She Loves You, yeah, yeah part. Okay, ready? So I'm gonna stop that. So notice that this is the, actually the opposite of I want to hold your hand. Because remember, this, this, this friend, is, is he loves the fact that he's making you sweat. You think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday, and it's you she's thinking of, and you know what she said? Right? You can almost sense this guy's just loving it, love the tension. So, of course, it doesn't make sense for the melody to go, you think you lost your love. I saw her yesterday. It's you she's thinking of. Remember, that's, that was the melody of I want to hold your hand. That doesn't make any sense in the drama of this song because this other friend, who's no longer going to be a friend, by the way, is, you know, really trying to, he's really trying to get you, get you worried, right? So that's why the music goes up because when you try to get someone excited, you know, when you're getting more excited and suspense goes up, your voice goes up. Now, of course, just like I want to hold your hand, what happens here? 
You think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday. It's you she's thinking of that she told me what to say. She said she loves you, right? And I'm, right? And there it is, the high note. And then there's the little, and you know that can't be bad. She said she loves you, and you know that can't be bad. Woo! Right? So again, just like before, it's this moment, the moment where we get the resolution, where we find out that she actually does still love you. That's the highest note. It's the resol It's that moment of. Uh, uh, it's that moment of, of 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 where the drama dissipates. Is where the suspension is resolved. And so the Beatles are building this up. This is like when I say, "I saw her yesterday. She was sick of you." You know what she said? She said she loves you. And then of course the other guy is saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And then we're all fine. So that's the way the the contour works. So I'll play for you again. Then I'll do one more thing about when we're going to return to our old friend harmonic rhythm. Remember, remember where to send the checks. All right, here we go. Ready? It's just so perfect. Now, what if we talk about harmonic rhythm? The opposite thing happens here. Here, the harmonic rhythm is every four beats as we started with, right? So every four beats. So we say, you think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday. It's you she's thinking of. And she told me what to say. That's every four beats, okay? Now, remember that what happened. Now, let's go back. Remember what happened I want to hold your hand? When, when, he, when she says basically, yes. He just gets so excited. He's just exhilarated. His heart starts to pound. He races. And that's why their harmonic rhythm goes faster. Because we want to feel like the music is quickening, just like your heartbeat might be quickening. That's not what happens to happen. Because imagine, imagine you were the guy that's being spoken to. Your heart rate might be going up here, but at this point, what happens to your heart rate? It should slow down, right? You should be relaxed. Oh, thank goodness. I don't have to stress out anymore. She actually still loves me. So of course, what do you think happens in the harmonic rhythm? You're 100% right. It slows down. It happens every eight beats. So we get these long, long the chords last longer. And the experience is that the music slows down in a dramatic way. Now, Ringo doesn't change how fast he plays the drums. Though to be honest, he adds a little Latin beat here, which works only works in a two bar in an AP pattern. Uh, but that's not 100% true, but this it works great like this. Anyway, the point is this. So this is an example where, again, the Beatles slow down the harmonic rhythm because it, it helps the listener literally feel the way that the character in the song feels, which is they feel more relaxed. I'm going to play that for you just because I know it might be hard to, just, it's hard to imagine. It, do the same thing. I'm going to clap every time a chord changes. And you'll notice the one I get to hear, she said she loves you. Suddenly I'm going to clap half as fast. And it's really like the music just, just slows down and it's like our heart rate suddenly. Uh, okay, let's try it. So these two songs are great because they're both from the same era and they're both basically the same thing where somebody, you know, somebody is curious about what's going to happen with their love. But it's really cool how the Beatles ratchet up the excitement for I want to hold your hand, just like your heart starts to beat fast. You're so excited. In this song, your heart slows down, right? Because you're relaxed, you're relieved. So these are just, just two examples of the Beatles' brilliant song. And now, if they could do this in a song that's two minutes and, you know, 20 seconds, of course, you, can you imagine what they would do with songs in which the lyrics are, frankly, much more complex or much more, or the music is, has more than, you know, four chords. Now, there are a lot of really other wonderful things about, um, about I Want to Hold Your Hand. I'm sorry, excuse me. I want to talk about Sie liebt dich, ja, ja, ja. Um, she loves you. Um, we talked about that. Um, what's real, another really cool thing is that, to be honest, and I'm not going to do this now, but um, this is a really cool form. Now, this form is also in an AABA form, like we talked about, Broadway, but it has this really cool, ref this, this chorus, this, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what's really awesome? It starts the very beginning of the song, and then you've got this, and then he, they, the Beatles stick in the, she loves you in the middle of the song, but it's not the whole thing. It's just half of it. It's kind of like pulling the rug out from it. If you don't believe me, listen right here. 
Now it should be, she loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it's not, it's, I'm going to play that passage just again. Because what's cool is that if you're singing along, you're probably going to end up singing the wrong part. Do that again. And you know what they don't, they only give you the whole she loves you, yeah, yeah thing at the very end of the song, like bookends. So this is just like a classical composer who might introduce, you know, her melody at the beginning, and then she'll write a whole symphony movement, and at the end, she'll bring the melody back at the end. And this is, you know, again, it's not like the Beatles didn't know in the music of, say, Beethoven, but they had internalized this. So I'm going to return to you here so I can say hi. Um, and um, hopefully from this, these last couple songs, this last, this last hour or so, you've seen that there's, there's a lot inside the Beatles' work as songwriters that it's, it's really, it's like, it's like the, the bones or the skeleton of the song that, that really make it work. Now, if you take this, this great songwriting, you add the haircuts and the screaming, right, and the dancing, you know, it's, it's irresistible. But we can't forget that the Beatles are the Beatles because they're songwriters. And the fact is that the Beatles' versions of a lot of these of their songs are, to my ears, not, not always the best versions. There are a lot of cover versions or remakes of Beatles songs that I think are better than the Beatles' versions. Um, that's not true for all of them. But that is a testament to the fact that it's the Beatles' songs that are so great. Because I could play you my version of uh, She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah on the piano. And you know what? It would be horrible. But you'd still recognize it as a great song. And there are many great cover versions of the Beatles. You know, it's like having a, it's like basically a, if you create a great recipe, it doesn't matter who makes it. It's still going to be delicious unless you really mess it up. Um, there are not a lot of bands like that. Um, a lot of times people put the Beatles against the Rolling Stones the Rolling Stones are much, more, much better performers. They're still touring. You know, you can't beat Mick Jagger as a front man. As songwriters, they can't hold a candle to the Beatles, I don't think. They have a couple classics. People don't release record after record after record of remakes of Stones songs because it's the Stones' records that are the best. But Beatles, people do release record after record after record of cover versions of the Beatles' songs. In case you're wondering, my favorite Beatles cover version of all time is Wicked Wilson Pickett doing Hey Jude. I think it's like 1969. And if you remember, what, remember Wilson Pickett? I'm going to wait to the midnight hour. Mustang Sally. You know, you can't beat this stuff. Just go do yourself a favor and listen to Wilson Pickett's Hey Jude if you've never heard it before. You haven't heard it in 50 years. It's a treat. It's better than the Beatles. Um, so what I would like to do now, I've got about a little bit less than half an hour left. And I'd like to see if there are any songs that are any of your favorites, which you might want to put in the chat. And maybe I'll take a few minutes and, and give you the, the short Professor Case version of why I think this, the song is a masterpiece. Now, pretty much any song you put there is going to be a masterpiece. Uh, I might have, I have some favorites myself. So if you're able to get to the chat function, uh, if you click on chat, you should be able to just type your messages, just name your song. So I want to give you a couple songs. I'll just wait till the songs roll in, and then I'll see which ones I can kind of summarize in a way that might make sense for our purposes here, okay? So I'll just give it a sec. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to actually do Norwegian Wood for a couple of reasons. One, because Nona Bryant's my favorite. I'm just kidding. I don't know you, Nona, but I'm very glad you suggested that, and... I'm sure you're great. No, the real reason is that this is a song which is a transitional song for the Beatles in their career. You know, it's on Rubber Soul, which is a transitional record. It's, you know, they'd started using pot. Thank you, Bob Dylan. And, um, oh my goodness, tomorrow I never know someone put it in. I mean, that's a song you go on for forever. Um, so the Beatles start to, to, to engage with a little bit of psychedelia uh, in Rubber Soul. And they also start to write songs that are definitely more adult in their focus. Um, and this is a great example of that. Um, so this is supposedly a story about a real, you know, experience that John Lennon had, as far as I know. I'm not a super Beatles fan, though. I mean, I bet you there are many of you out there who know more about the history of the Beatles than I do. I know enough to teach, you know, you know, some classes on the Beatles, but I, I, my focus is really on how the music works. So 
I let some other musicologists do the other stuff. Um, but what, what, so if you don't know the song, let me grab it. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to, we'll play it. I'm, I'm going to give me just a moment, please. Thanks for your patience. And I'm going to bring up the lyrics as well. So we can just, um, so we can hear it. So um, give me just a moment and get it ready. And I'm going to try to find the lyrics, which should not be hard. Okay, so this, I'm going to try to make it nice and big so we can see. And then I'm going to share my screen. All right. Okay. Okay, here we go. Norwegian Wood. Um, um, sorry about that. Okay, give me just a moment. That is not it. Let me try. There are a lot of different versions of the songs out there. Give me just a moment. So many good. Okay, great. So I'm going to try this. Let's make it happen. So before we hear this song, I want to point out this once again. As radical as the Beatles were, this is uh, in the same form as their parents' favorite Broadway songs. There's an A here. There's another A. Then there's a B. The music is different. And then there's another A, back to the original music. Then the Beatles put in a sitar solo here. And then, um, and then we return for an A. Now, this is a narrative song, and um, I want to point out a couple things about the lyrics. Um, the very, first of all, just before we play the song, notice just the, little, the wonderful pun here that shows the Beatles are starting to think about their, their lyrics as poetry. I once had a girl, or should I say she once had me? Now, that could mean two things. He said, I had a girl. In that case, it's sort of a word, the word had, the verb has no real connotation. It means like, you know, it doesn't really mean possession. It basically means, you know, I had a girlfriend, you know, she was my girlfriend. Or should I say she once had me? Now, there are one way it can mean is that she had the power in the relationship. She had me as a boyfriend, which, look, you know, 1966, you know, girls didn't ask guys out to dances that very often. But really, it's a foreshadowing. It's the use of the verb had as to pull the wool over your eyes, right? I once had a girl, or should I say she once had me, right? So we don't know that's happening yet, but as we know, it's going to happen. She showed me her room, okay? Isn't it good Norwegian wood, okay? And this supposedly that, that, that the house where this happened was made of Norwegian wood, supposedly. So what happens when a girl has the forthrightness to say, hey, come look at my room? Oh, wow, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a, She's a woman's liber. She's willing to, to go out and ask me up. Wow, okay. Pretty progressive for the Beatles, right? And the Beatles, frankly, are some of the, uh, if you look at the Beatles, mu Beatles, excuse me, the Beatles music, if you look at it through the lens of feminism, they had a remarkably uh, high uh, um, and, and respectful attitude towards women. Look at, even, just look at I Want to I you know, Drive My Car, right? There are a lot of songs where the woman has the power, which is pretty rare for pop music in general, especially pop music by men. Anyway, moving on. So what's the rest of the story? She asked me to stay. And you know what he's thinking? I can't say it because this is a family program, right? Then she told me to sit anywhere, right? But then he looks around and guess what? There wasn't a chair. Let's be very clear. She has got this guy wrapped around his finger. She asks him up. She says, oh, sure, you can stay. Just, take a, just sit wherever you want. He looks around. Nowhere to sit. Now, maybe that means that she... You know, maybe she embraced, you know, Asian culture. Maybe she sat on the floor. But regardless, she is, she is a very creative young lady. So he sat on the rug, biding his time, drinking her wine. They talked until two, and then she said, it's time for bed. All right, now I'm going to stop there, and let's listen up to that point. Okay, so what is this guy thinking? Again, I cannot say because this is a family program. But the music tells you. Now, don't forget, this is 1966. And the very sound of a sitar wasn't just surprising for pop music. It was surprising for any Western audience. 
Now, also, don't forget that 50 years ago, and I, I, many of you, you know, you, you, you might be able to tell me you might have been around. Um, even today, there, are, there is a musical connotation to Indian music. Now, at the time in the 60s, a lot of rock and rollers and a lot of pop culture figures jumped onto the train about Eastern spirituality. They saw this as an as a alternate for the culture, counterculture to, to straight laced society, to Christian America, Christian Western Europe. But to be honest, and I, I hate to be cynical here, for a lot of young people, West Eastern culture meant it was symbolic of rebellion, but it was also about drugs and sex um, and the whole counterculture. So the, the sitar, what we're about to hear is a sitar solo. And you have to put yourself in the, in the in, you have to put your ears on from 50 years ago and think, what, why, what does it mean for a listener to hear a sitar play for eight measures here? What did, it, what did Indian music mean? Well, it meant counterculture. It meant spirituality, but it also meant sex. It was, this is a very exoticist use of the in instrument. Basically, what's happening during this little instrumental bridge is they're making love, right? And this is a, a problematic in a sense because, of course, you know, reducing Indian music, which is a 2,000-year-old classical tradition, to just being this exoticized Kama Sutra sex kind of music. I mean, that's, of course, that's based on a, a lack of, of knowledge, it's based on a very sort of Eurocentric approach to other cultures. And look, we all make mistakes. But this is very interesting here how we see right this moment when the Beatles want to, sh they can't describe the two people making love, but they can demonstrate it using music. And what do they pick? 20 years before, they would have picked a saxophone. They would have played the blues because of the connection of African-American culture and sex. Here, they're, they're choosing the new Symbol, the new symbolic sound for, for, ero for eroticism and sex, which is the sitar. So here they are having sex. <laughs> Fooled you. They didn't have sex. What happened? The Beatles completely fooled you because everybody in their world would have heard this sitar and they would have thought, oh, she said it's time for bed. Oh, I know the Beatles can't describe it in the lyrics, but I'm imagining it. But what happened? The story picks up. And instead of, we woke up the next morning, ha, ha, ha. No, we just continue the story. She said, well, she said, it's time for bed. Of course, he's thinking, oh, that's me and you in bed. And she's, no, 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 no. When I say it's time for bed, it's my, it's time for me to go to bed. I work in the morning. What? You thought, Oh, no, 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 no. What kind of girl do you think I am? And he's ashamed. He's humbled and embarrassed. He realized he had been had. She strung him along. He said, I didn't. Now, what does he do passively, aggressively? He goes to bed in the bathroom, right? This is, the, this is Britain, so the bath didn't literally mean the bathtub and the bathroom, right? But he just stayed. Oh, I'm still staying, he says, right? Because it was 2 a.m., you know, there's no cabs running. When he awoke, she was gone. He's still in her apartment, right? But she, she's the one who left. This is the worst kind of one night stand when there isn't even a stand. <laughs> it's just a night, right? <laughs> right? And then the bird had flown. Now that's his little jive. He calls her a bird, you know? This bird had flown. You know, that's kind of a way of almost you know, disrespecting a woman. Oh, she's a cute bird. But you know, it's clearly his, that's all he has left is his words. He can call her a bird. He can call her a dame. He can call her a broad. But whatever he wants to call her, she wore the pants here and she strung him along, you know? So he lit a fire. In her, in her apartment, maybe she burned down the place. Who knows? But the idea is that this is a song about a woman who had a guy. And also what's great with this song is how the Beatles use this this little bridge here to fake you out, to make you think that this is just a, not just a love song, it's a song about sex. But you know what? Just, and this is what's brilliant about the song, not only did the woman pull the wool over and trick the guy, the Beatles pulled the wool over the listener and tricked the listener because the listener thought they were going to, they were going to have, they were going to experience in some way, imagine these people making love, but they don't. It's such a brilliant song. There's this little sort of, sort, of, sort of wonderful moment where there's this sort of bait and switch. And so the result is that at this moment when we come back from the, from the sitar and she, we realize that they didn't 
make love, we feel the same thing that the, that the, that the character feels. We feel, oh, I'm embarrassed. I thought they were having sex. So it's just a brilliant song because it makes the listener feel the same way. And, you know, that's the same thing that I Want to Hold Your Hand does. The music gets faster right when the narrator gets excited. In the same way, She Loves You allows the listener to relax the moment when the, when the narrator or the character suddenly feels relieved. Again, another example of how the Beatles' music really is what tells the story. And, and it's almost like the Beatles' lyrics by themselves, they are extraordinary black and white drawings. And you know what? A great black and white drawing, you don't need the color. You don't, okay? But when you add color, it adds another, a completely other dimension. That's why you don't compare a painting to a woodcut, right? Or a sketch to an oil painting. They're different genres. And frankly, the Beatles are songwriters. So we can't forget when we look at the Beatles, not just look at their lyrics, but look at how the music brings a completely different or supporting kind of dimension to their work. So um, I'm going to stop my share here. Um, yeah, I don't, there's a question here, but did you light the fire in the fireplace? Did you set the whole place on fire? I always thought that it was, I thought I read somewhere that he set the whole place on fire. Maybe you could look that up for me. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, what else could he do? Um, <laughs> uh, someone also mentioned that they love the melody in this m m song, and maybe it might make sense since I don't think we'll have time to look at another song, but maybe I'll do this just to finish up. Um, I'm gonna, maybe I'll just have an opportunity just to talk about the melody of this music. By the way, that's, it's no, it's not, it's not, it should not be surprising that the Beatles meet Bob Dylan in the hotel room in New York City. He introduces them to pot, and then they start to write a folk song, right, with a guitar. So that's not surprising. Um, I'm going to go share my screen just one more time, and maybe just to, to show about the melody. So if we think about the melody, I'm just going to, maybe I can do this thing. I'll, I'll, I'll draw it as we listen to it and make, make a couple of comments about how the melody itself tells this story. So that's the melody of the whole song. I'm sorry, this is a little, we didn't go back in time here. I just, my finger slipped. Um, I just wanted to point out here that, you know, the Beatles are master, of course, songwriters and their melody, it's a really interesting melody. I have listened to a lot of songs in my life and I teach songwriting. There are not a lot of songs that have a melody that goes down. By far, I don't know what percentage, maybe 90% of, of songs that you hear over the last 50 years have a melody that goes up. It's pretty rare to see a song that goes down. It's also pretty rare to see a song that has these big leaps. Um, she, we talked until two, then until she said, uh, it's time for bed. That's hard to sing. Most pop songs and rock songs just sort of stay around the four or five notes around here. So that's really interesting. I think that the melody kind of implies that there's, there's a little more under the surface than we think. There's that foreshadowing of the word, she had me, right? It means two things. Now, let's imagine you write a really interesting melody that goes down, down, down and have these big leaps. If you do that twice, it's hard to do it a third time. Melodies are kind of like spice in a song. Um, if you're cooking, maybe this is a really, you know, maybe this is smoked paprika, garlic powder, and cayenne pepper. There's a lot here. It's, you almost have to, you know, have another taste to really savor it. But, you know, you can't have too much of a highly, highly spiced or flavorful dish. You know, after a few bites, you maybe need to have some mashed potatoes. Or maybe if you're at a really fancy restaurant, they'll bring you a little sorbet and you get like a little lemon sorbet, you know. Do you all remember restaurants? Wasn't that nice when you go to restaurants? Yeah, anyway. That's kind of what happens here. Because you know what? If we just look at the drawing of this, this melody in the B section, um, it's, it's, it's got two parts in, in, in uh, Len, Paul, Paul and John. But you'll notice it's pretty boring. Da, 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 da. It's what we call stepwise. It just goes up and down the up and down the scale. It's really boring. If a student brought this melody into me at the beginning of the song, I'd say, "You need to be more creative." Just goes up and down. But you know what? It's the perfect melody for this song because this is like the mashed potatoes or the lemon sorbet. You need to have it here because this is too rich, too spicy. So. 
um, again, the Beatles write this really complicated up and down melody. It sort of says, hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of richness in here. There's a lot of spice. And then they really have to give you a part that's much less interesting or else it's too much spice. And then they return and they go back to the same melody, but they didn't draw it very well. By the way, this is exactly what happens in Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Remember, it's somewhere over the rainbow, blah, blah, blah. That's that really complicated up and down. And then again, somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, da, 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 da. And then what's the little part? I like to tell my students, this is quite possibly the most beautiful and the best melody in 20th century music. And you know what happens here? The worst melody in the history of popular music. Because you know how it goes. When happy little bluebirds fly, da 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 da. It is the it's two notes. Again, if a student came in and said, "Hey, Professor Case, here's my melody," la 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 la, I would say, "What is that? The siren? You know, from the from from the from the ambulance?" Okay, but why is it the perfect melody? Because if you're gonna write the greatest melody of the 20th century with all of its richness, its up and downs. You can't do that too much. You have to have lemon sorbet to bring you back. And of course, at the end of this song, she sings, that's where you'll find me. And then she returns. So it's interesting how, you know the Beatles knew somewhere over the rainbow. Now, did they study it in theory class? No. But they clearly knew, you know, whether it's John or Paul, they knew that that's how you write a song. You write, if you're going to write a really complicated, interesting, rich melody, you've got to balance it out by something less interesting in the middle. And that's exactly what happens in, in, in Norwegian Wood. Notice we're not talking about the lyrics at all here. We're literally talking about the notes. Um, but this just goes to show you that if you heard this song without the lyrics, it would work as a piece of music. Beethoven symphonies don't have words because the music tells a story and the music brings you from point to point it, it, it asks questions, it answers them, it, it gives you spice, it gives you sorbet. You can listen to the Beatles, a lot of the Beatles music like that. The lyrics, of course, provide another dimension. But this sort of graph here shows you the Beatles music itself it has the kind of richness that, that, that is going to make it stand you know, the test of time. So I have to... I have to finish up in a couple of minutes, but if I, and we won't have time to look at another song. But if there are any quick questions that I might be able to answer, you, you could put them in the chat. Um, if not, you could always reach out to me, just find me on Wheaton College or my web, I can just type my website in. Uh, you can visit my website and you can just find a, an, you, can, you can email me from there. And don't be afraid of like saying, hey, you know in that song, got to get you into my life, there's a, something that happens, what's that? I would love to answer that question for you. You know, as I tell my students, I'm a teacher because I like teaching. So, <laughs> and I like answering questions. So if anybody feels like asking me any question about the Beatles and we don't have time now, please feel free to just send me an email.